what trials do to us. <sighs> what are the things that trials do to us? One of our keynote scriptures will be James chapter 1. From verse 2 to verse 4, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So, it, the Bible says we must count it all joy when we fall into various trials. So the question is, what are some of the reasons which can enable us to tolerate trials, to, to be able to tolerate trials? What do trials do in us? The first point of what trials do to us is that uh, trials facilitate the display of God's power. They enable God to use us to display his power. They enable God to display his power. <clears throat> That's the first point on what trials do to us. They make us an oven through which God can display his power. Hallelujah. 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 They enable God to display his power. John chapter 9, verse 1 and verse 2. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. It's a very sorry situation. He was no longer a boy, he was now a man. Blind from birth. And these disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Because many people, they take disability as a curse. Disability. Maybe disability in terms of mobility, or disability in terms of hearing, or disability in terms of sight or even mental disability. Some, they take it as a case. I've heard many people express those sentiments that if someone produces a disabled child or someone becomes disabled, it means God has cast them. There is a scene which took place. But let us listen to this passage. It says, now as Jesus passed by, you saw a man who was born blind from birth. I mean, who was blind from birth. He was born blind. And these disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me, while it is day, the night is coming when no one can wake. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay, and he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore the disciples and those who, were, who previously had seen 
that he was blind, said, Is not this he who sat and prayed? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. And he said, I am he. Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes opened? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? And he said, I do not know. The passage that I read, we see someone who is clearly disabled, who is blind. There is something which the apostles say, according to their reasoning and their belief system, they said, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. So there are some people who are disappointed. God is waiting for vessels that he can use, just like God used Jesus Christ when he was here on earth. God is looking for vessels that he can use so that the works of God are revealed in those people who are undergoing trial. Imagine this man, he was born blind. He was now a man. We don't know how old he was. But uh, we see that God permitted him to be born blind because he knew that Jesus Christ was going to perform the works of God upon that man. So this is the first instance. The second instance is found in John chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In this lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. When angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water, then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. So this man had a sickness for, for 38 years. We, we don't know whether he was 38 years old or the sickness started when he was 10 years old and then he had the sickness for 38 years. We don't really know. The man might have been 60-something or even 70-something. What we are just told in, in verse 5 is that this man had an infirmity for 38 years. And then when Jesus saw him lying there, he, knew that he already had been in that condition a long time. He said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, say, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise up. I mean, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. So there is a man who was healed on the Sabbath, but he was healed after 38 years of suffering with the same sickness. So we don't determine, as human beings, the length of our trial. It's God who determines the length of the trial. What we just need to do as Christians is to, to be willing verses for God to display his power. So the first thing which trials do in us is that they make us proper verses for God to display his power. We become proper verses for the Almighty God to display His power, because God wants to display His power. 
but for him to display his power, that he is the healer. He must permit certain people among us to, to be ill. Or for God to be known as a miracle worker, he must permit people like this lame man, this paralyzed man, or the man who was born blind to be blind, so that he can demonstrate his power. So there are some situations which are not necessarily disability where people, they try everything in their power and they fail to succeed. And only God moves in their situation. So the first thing which trials do in us is that they prepare us for God to display his power. Trials prepare us for God to display his power. So for 38 years, this paralyzed man was being prepared by God for God to display his power through Jesus Christ. This is miraculous healing power. So when we move Elta Skelta and we run all over the place, it means we will be demonstrating that we are ill prepared for God to demonstrate his what? His power. So trials afford God the opportunity in us to demonstrate his power. What is the second work of trials to us? What do trials do in us? The second work of trials in us. What is the second work? Psalm chapter 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in Trump. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in Trump. Psalm chapter 91. Psalm 91, verse 14. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trample. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. The Bible says, I'll be with him in Trump. I'll read verse 46, I mean chapter 46, verse 1 again. What is our refuge and strength? A very present help in Trump. I want to read it from the Good News translation before I make the second point. Or before I articulate the second point. Psalm chapter 46. Verse 1. It says, What is our shelter and strength? Always ready to help in times of trouble. So, wh one problem that we have uh, on earth is the problem of independence. The This thought of being independent, even to the point of desiring to be independent from God. It's very easy for me to demonstrate how people try to be independent even from God. How many people pray on their own when they don't have problems? A person just wakes up and says, I will spend three hours just to praying to fellowship with God. There are very few. They are there. But you may discover that in a country or in the whole world, there are very few. During the times of Noah, it was just Noah himself. In any given generation, the people are truly consecrated. We desire God for who he is, with or without problems are very few. 
the majority of us we run to court when there are problems. We remember court is our hiding place. So court is our shelter. We know a shell, the shelter, you use shelter to hide from the elements in the atmosphere. And we know that court is not a physical shelter, it's a spiritual shelter. To hide from certain spiritual atmospheres. To hide from certain spiritual weather elements. It says always ready to help in times of trouble. So in life there are times which are called times of trouble. They are there. They are good times and times of what? Of trouble. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1 To everything there is a season a time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. And so on. Verse 8, a time to love and a time to hate. Some people, they experience what I just said, even in their marriages or their families. There is a time when they love one another and then a time when they start to hate one another until they divorce. When the time to hate arrives in a marriage, and then court is not your shelter. Divorce just occurs. And a time of war and a time of peace. In Ukraine, they know right now the time which they are going through is a time of war. It won't be always like that. There will be peace in Ukraine. But right now they are going through what? War. It's a time of war. So, times of trouble, according to the Good News translation in verse 1b of Psalm 46, it says, always ready to help in times of trouble. God knows that during times which are not times of trouble, people in most cases don't need help. They, <laughs> they don't ask for help. Uh, the Bible says uh, uh, always ready to help in times of trouble. It didn't say always, uh, uh, always ready to help at all times. Because God knows that at other times when people are not in trouble, they don't need his help. Though we need God at all the time, but people have got this thought that when my job is paying me very well, I'm paying rent, I'm able to settle all of my bills then I don't need God. There are many people who don't pray. Millionaires and billionaires. The fellow will be just flying all over the earth. But if God were to allow the billionaire to become a poor person, one moment you are the richest man or richest woman on earth, the next moment you have got nothing, you are asking for, for food. You will be forced also to read the Bible. You just to find yourself reading the Bible, looking for answers about this complicated thing called life. So what is the second thing which trials do to us? The second thing is that trials humble us to seek shelter from God, shelter or protection from God. They humble us to seek shield or protection from God. Because human beings, they like to be in control. I want us to confess and say, I like to be in control. 
Uh, even if you think you don't like to be in control, just to confess is the truth. Say, I like to be in control. Uh, let me confess something. <laughs> if I had a way of just having, getting things done without praying, I could have just gotten them done. And then maybe just to say to God, you know, Father, I, I love you so much, maybe for three minutes. Uh, I, I love you so much. Eh? Thank you, Lord. Most probably out of guilt, that I'll be too busy getting things done. <laughs> yeah. So tires, they humble us so that we seek shelter or protection from God. That's why God says is our shelter and strength. Is our shelter and what? Strength. So this leads us to the third reason. Why God permits trials? The third reason why God permits trials, He permits trials so that we can be weakened. I know the Bible says God is going to strengthen us with might in the inner man, but not before He weakens us. Not before he what? He weakens us. Someone will say, but Pastor Andrew, where are you taking these things from? Let us rush to 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 12. So times they come to weaken us. They come to weaken us. That's the purpose of times. It's one of the major purposes of times, to weaken a person. <laughs> because <laughs> if God does not weaken you, you will be a manocha of some sort. What we call a manocha in the colloquial level, a person who knows it all, wears it all covered. When you think you have it all covered, you will discover you've got a miniscate of a solution for a very huge problem. <laughs> it discover your problem, your your solution. Your your solution is like an handkerchief, and then your problem is like the size of your pot, and you want to cover you. What you need is not an handkerchief; it's a blanket. You can't use the handkerchief to cover yourself when when you want to feel warm. You need a blanket. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. A thorn in the flesh was given to whom? To Paul. A messenger of Satan to perfect me. So Paul was given a messenger of Satan, not a sickness. The word translated messenger there in Greek is Achelos. It's Achelos or Angelos. So, a, an evil spirit was released to perfect Paul. Lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. The thing which he's talking about is an evil spirit. How was it perfecting him? Wherever Paul went, the evil spirit was fomenting trouble and opposition against Paul. This evil spirit, this Achelos of Satan, or messenger of Satan, which, by the way, is not a sickness. Paul was not sick. Was some, I read, I've read numerous books which say Paul was sick. He, he had a problem with his eyes. No, the problem with his eyes, if you read your Bible very carefully, I think it's in Acts chapter 9, he was healed of that problem. Hallelujah. He was healed when... When Saint Ananias laid his hands on Apostle Paul, he was completely healed from that problem. That's why Paul was able to write letters. You can read the account in Acts 9. 
the, the eye problem was healed. Before he even started preaching, he no longer had an eye problem. He received the complete healing. The, the problem that Paul encountered is that the, the devil always sent evil spirits to, to resist his ministry. At one point, he even says that I wanted to come to you, but Satan forbade me. How did Satan accomplish this? Through an archelos of Satan, through an angel, through an evil spirit that the devil had designated to fight Paul wherever he went. So he says he pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from him. Listen to the response of the Lord. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. My strength is made perfect in what? In weakness. So the third reason or the third point of what trials do to us is that they weaken us so that God can perfect his strength in us. God cannot perfect his strength in a strong person. If someone is a billionaire and then God gives that person 500 million, how, how will that person see that it is God who gave him 500 million? But if someone doesn't have anything, is begging for money, and then six months later you are a billionaire, through means that you can't explain, you will be crediting God with that financial breakthrough because at the beginning of the year you are weak. You don't have anything. At the end of the year, you are very strong financially. You know this has to be caught. There is no meaningful, I mean there is no logical reason to explain how you became a billionaire in one year. You will be knowing this is the, the handiwork of God. This is God who has done this. So trials, they weaken us. I want us to make a very dangerous prayer. Say, I need to be weak. I didn't say you want it. You need it for God to perfect his strength. Because the verse say, there in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 says, And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So if a, a Christian does not want to be weak, it means that Christian does not want God to perfect his strength in him or her. But if you want God to perfect his strength in you, then you must allow God to weaken you in a certain area of your life. And here I'm not talking about sin as weakness. Sin is not a weakness. It can be caused by weakness, but sin is not a weakness. Sin is disobedience. Sin is lawlessness, according to the book of 1 John. I'm not talking about sin. I'm just talking about weakness, which is caused by a trial. Like Job, when he was sitting in the airship, he had been weakened by trials. So that God would perfect his strength. You read Job chapter 42. The man has a double portion and ten more children, in addition to those who died. God had perfected his strength. Job chapter 1, God allows Satan to attack Job. What's, what did God have in mind? He wanted Job to be weakened so that before angels, God would perfect the strength of Job. So as I'm talking, there is someone who is feeling weak because of the trials that they are going through. Their marriage which has just collapsed the job which they've just lost, the sickness that they've been fighting or nursing for so many years, or the financial problems that they've been having. They've tried this and that business. It has not worked. Don't worry. God is weakening you to perfect his strength. Because the strength of God is perfected in what? In weakness. It's perfected in what? In weakness. And then number four of what trials do to us is that trials prepare us for service. 
they prepare for uh, they prepare us for what for service where do we find this where do we find this let us go back to our keynote script james chapter 1 verse 2 my brethren count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience say patience but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing here it's not talking about perfect and complete lacking nothing as in material things it's talking about courage it's talking about what courage a character that lacks patience is a character that lacks everything. A character that lacks patience is a character that lacks everything. A character that lacks patience is a character that lacks everything. Because it means you will do, you will do most of the things that you will be doing at the wrong time. In, in most cases, you will be doing things prematurely. Before the right set of circumstances is in place, or before God actually moves, or before God prompts you by the Holy Spirit to do certain things, just because you are able to prophesy, you will be all over the place doing crusades and trying to prophesy on your own because you are not patient. There are many people who even force other people to recognize that they are apostles and prophets. And then when they encounter problems, they then look for answers. But Pastor and Love, I'm an apostle, and the, at the early stages of my ministry, I used to move seriously in miracles. All of a sudden, things have stalled. No, things have not stalled. God is busy producing patience because you don't have patience. In Shona, it's called Gushingirira. It's endurance. But the patience has got an aspect of endurance. Because we are talking about trials here. We are not just talking about a person who is sitting under comfortable conditions. The kind of patience that I'm talking about is patience of someone who is going through adversity, which is actually endurance. But I mean, the, the, the kind of patience that I'm talking about, it's endurance. Not just ordinary patience. Because there are different kinds of patience. Maybe I should teach a sermon on that uh, later on. There are different types of patience. If someone is waiting for a bus at a station, they are not suffering. It's just a person who is just waiting for a bus. Uh, on, while least they are doing WhatsApp. They might not even feel that they are waiting for anything. Or if you are waiting for visitors, or at least you are watching your favorite show on TV, you are just seated at home, still you are patient. But you are not patient like Job who is waiting for healing and for 10 more children and for his wealth to be restored by God. You are not, you are not patient like Daniel in a lion's den. A person who is waiting for visitors to come is patient. But their patience is not endurance. You can't tell people when you are waiting for visitors that I'm enduring. The kind of patience that we are talking about is patience in face of negative circumstances or adversity. yes. So this kind of patience is the one which I am saying if a person lacks it, they've got nothing. If a person lacks that kind of patience, they lack everything. I want us to confess and say, if I lack patience, I lack, I lack everything. Once more, if I lack patience, I lack, I lack everything. In my dealings with people, I've realized that most people are impatient, including pastors including pastors. I will tell you a story. There is a pastor in the past that I wanted to see. 
I wanted to see that pastor. Very seriously. He's a pastor who is mightily used of God. He doesn't live in Zimbabwe. <clears throat> so for me to, to be able to, to, to contact that pastor, it took me more than two years. Almost three years, maybe two years and almost ten months. For me to, to be able to, not even to, to, to talk to that pastor on the phone, but to talk to the junior pastor who works with that pastor. It took me almost three years. But I was patient. I kept on what? Trying. I was patient. Later on, to cut a long story short, I saw that pastor, he didn't take time to pr pray for me. I saw that pastor, he spoke words in my life, most of which I've seen come to pass. And then he told me things will not happen at once. It will take quite a bit of time. Just learn to be patient. Those are the words that he spoke. And for me to see that past, I went to the church at 7 o'clock in the morning. At around half past seven, I was at the church gates or entrance. And then by eight o'clock, I was now singing because they start with the praise and worship. We were now singing. The only time I would be going out of the church was when I'm going to relieve myself at the rooms of convenience or restrooms or toilets. But otherwise, I was in church until the service was dismissed at half past ten at night. And then that's when they started one on one. And I was told that since I was near the church, I was lodged near the church, I didn't need to worry about how I would get to the place where I was lodged. I had to wait until they finished with people who were driving out of town to, to a place which is almost 300 kilometers away, 200 and something kilometers away. So I waited from around half past 10 until I saw that pastor at around uh, 20 past 1 of the following day. It was already a Monday. It was, it was a Sunday service. So I was in church for almost 24 hours. The thought, because I had numbers of people who had taken me from the airport, and the people were taking me around town. So the temptation when I was looking at my phone to call a text and just sneak out and go away, it was very high. Say impatience. But then when I realized I, I left my country, specifically to see this man, if I rush back to, to the hotel, how will it assist me? I will just go back to my country empty-ended. It's better I just stay here. If I fall asleep, they will wake me up to see the man. I started to, to think... I spent uh, almost 12 hours flying. So for me to wait for two and a half more hours to see that past, how will it harm me? After seeing him, I can then go and sleep. After all, it's like I'm on vacation. I can go and sleep from even 3 o'clock and then wake up at 10 o'clock. Still, I would have slept properly. So. I believe it's the Holy Spirit who was telling me that. So I was patient until I saw that uh, servant of God. And he pronounced the words, and after pronouncing words upon my life, he gave me anointing oil. He gave me a big bottle of anointing oil. And he said, go and use it. Your way is open. God will cause you to be known in many places. That's what that servant of God is saying. He pointed out the hindrances and certain weaknesses that were there in my character. 
and they also pointed out this issue of impatience because I easily gave up. You know, that's the weakness of most educated people. Most educated people are arrogant. They are arrogant. I deal with educated people. Even undereducated people are sometimes arrogant. I know some people may be angry with me when I say that. <laughs> I didn't say uneducated people. There are people who are, because there are people who are uneducated. The majority of them are not arrogant. And then there are people who are undereducated. Undereducated and educated people are arrogant. People with some form of education. So if you are highly educated or you are a professional in something, usually such people who have got some degree, some certificate, some something which they have, they usually don't wait. I've seen even, sometimes the Holy Spirit tells me to lend them the church service on Sundays. He tells me two declarations. I do declarations. I ask the Holy Spirit, why the Holy Spirit are you saying I must do declarations? The Holy Spirit tells me I want to weaken the people before I perfect my strength. I want to weaken them. <laughs> Just like I weakened you, I want to weaken them. Because with me, I've never done a church service. Except for maybe when I was in Arab, but I've never done a church service which was more than 15 hours. The longest church service that I did, it was from around 10 in the morning and it ended at 20 past 8 in the evening in Arar. It took almost 12 hours. That's the longest church service that I've ever done. I know very soon I'll be doing church services, which some which are 26 hours. Of course there will be breaks, some which are 30 hours. We'll do them. Those people who are arrogant, who are impatient, they will not get anything. I've seen some people, you look at a person during the church service, because I delayed to finish the service by 30 minutes, you see the person is angry. He's walking out of the church service. He's walking very fast. He's angry. Why are you angry? In this church, they finish the service late. How do you know that we finish late? When is this church service supposed to be finished? Is there any timetable that you saw? For you to say we finish the church service late. There is no timetable. Just imagine Jesus Christ. Some of his church services, they took three days to finish. There was a time when he fed the thousands of people. The church service was three days in a bush. In a place where people didn't have access to food, they didn't have access to shelter. Or they were just sleeping in the open to listen to his ministration. Yet in our time, when hypothetically the service is supposed to end at two, no one tells them that the service is supposed to end at two. And then quarter past two, the pastor is still speaking one or two points, adding another one or two points to the one or two points. And then the person becomes angry. They pick it down and they, they, <laughs> they, start, they go home without a breakthrough. Because they don't want God to weaken them. If you don't want God to weaken you, it means you don't want his strength to be made perfect in you. And if you don't want the strength of God to be made perfect in you, it means you are not fit for service. Because trials, they, they prepare us for what? For service. By refining our character. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 3. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. <laughs> we also glory in what? In breakthroughs. Huh? 
We also glory in what? In breakthroughs. In very serious breakthroughs. When we have, when we have just acquired a company for 44 billion US dollars. <laughs> we glory after acquiring a company for 44 billion US dollars. Do you think God will permit you as a Christian? To, do you think that will refine your character? We also glory in very serious breakthroughs. Hmm? We also glory in very serious breakthroughs. But we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance correct. Perseverance produces, it's, a, it's, a, it's an industry. It says tribulation is the primary, it's the primary input. It produces an intermediate commodity called perseverance. And perseverance produces an almost semi-finished product, which is called character. But character is meant to produce something. Character hope. Because a person without courage, they can't continue to hope in the things that God has promised, especially if the fulfillment of these things is far away. And the only thing which will connect you to your destiny or to your future is hope. The connection between you and the things which God has promised, which are waiting for you in the future, all of your breakthroughs are waiting for you in the future. But your present day connection to your breakthroughs which are waiting for you in the future is a pyre. A pyre, P-I-E-R. It's a pyre called, called hope. It's a pyre called what? Hope. You know a bridge connects two points over which you can't navigate through natural means. If there is a bridge, you can even cross a 30-ton lorry on the bridge. You can even cross on foot. You don't need to stress. You don't need to, first of all, pray in tongues. If there is a bridge, you can cross on a bridge, tongues or no tongues. That road over a river, because a bridge is a road over a river. It's a road over a what? Or a railway line. If it, is a, 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 if it is a railway line over a river, then it's a flyover of some sort. But a road over a river, it's a what? It's a bridge. And then there are some metal, there are some metal beams, structures, which support that road, and there are pillars underneath. The metal structures that support that road, so that the road, you know, the forces, they don't compromise the quality of the road over a river. That's a hope. Those metal structures, they bring stability. The structures underneath, they, they give what? Support. The pillars underneath they are for support, not for stability. We know support is the necessary condition of stability. But support does not cause stability. What causes stability? It's something which is constructed to balance the forces on something. As you move from the present to the future, there are so many forces that are acting on you. Just like as, as a car moves from point A to point B, there are certain laws of thermodynamics which will be operating on the car, and other laws which were discovered by people like, say, Isaac Newton, and many other physicists. But for a car to be able to continue moving, it must establish a balance in the internal forces which are generated within the car itself, and the external forces which exist in the environment, as well as inertia, 
which is caused by the fact that the car is navigating or guiding on a, what? On a physical surface, which is called the ground. Amen. So for it to, 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 to have mobility, it must first of all establish an equilibrium between internal and external forces. That equilibrium between internal and external forces is what we call stability. So spiritually speaking, for you to attain the promises of God, now I feel like I'm talking in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I feel the authority. <laughs> <laughs> for you to attain the promises of God the forces that are operating on you internal they must balance out the forces that are operating external both physical forces and spiritual forces but for the forces that are operating within you internal to balance out external forces as you glide or navigate towards the fulfillment of the promises of God, you must have something which is called stability of current. You must have something which is called what? Stability of current. Many people, they give up quite easily. Or they give up when they are left with a short time to attain the promises of God. Why? Because they lack stability of what? Of current. I want us to confess and say, Lord Jesus, I need stability of current. There are some people, I will say a statement which, which will anger a lot of people, but I'm not saying it to anger anyone. There are some people who are not yet married who according to the opinion of God ought to have been married long ago. I didn't say everyone who is not yet married lacks stability of courage. I want you to understand me very clearly. There are many reasons why people delay in marriage. Some they delay in marriage to pursue a certain career. And it just happens that the brother who was eyeing them, well, because... People don't disclose to a potential brother who will be eyeing them that I'm pursuing a career, be patient. Because for starters, the sister won't be knowing that there is a brother eyeing her. She might be so engrossed in her books until this brother says, Ah, I'm getting old. Let me just marry. In life, if you get lemons, you make lemonade. If you get lemons and the other things, you make marmalade sometimes. <laughs> you have to make do with what you have. And then the brother says, ah, this one that I've been eyeing. Ah, first degree. A second first degree called an honor's degree. A master's degree, a second master's degree. A PhD, a third degree. After the PhD, CTA, after CTA, CIMA, after CIMA, CIS, ah, I will be waiting forever here. And then the brother decides, ah, let me, let me find someone to marry. In the meantime, it's the brother whom God had prepared for that particular sin. But it's just that the sister was what? Occupied. The same thing can also happen on brothers. As a pastor, I deal with many brothers who can't find a person to marry. I know most sisters will be saying, what do you mean who can't find a person to marry? People have got what they prefer. Even sisters who may not be married as yet, it's not that they can't find men, literally, who, can't who don't want to marry them. They'll be finding what they considered to be the wrong kind of a man. Not that the person is wrong in a literal sense, but the, 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 the person doesn't have the attributes or the qualities that they are looking for. So, the, the, the brother continues to study endlessly until the sister that 
this brother was supposed to marry is married to someone else, especially because of her step character and her good character. She gets snatched by brothers who are very fast. Because they are brothers who are very fast. They don't waste time. They see a sister who is stable in terms of character. They just take the sister and put her in jail. And put, take her home. Well, it's to are busy theorizing about, you know, organizing the source of income so that I've got a stable income. Uh, hey, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's to are busy trying to balance out to those things. The brother who is very aggressive, who doesn't theorize a lot, who knows that the wealth is not a textbook. <laughs> That the world, this is real life. The, there's no time to write corrections. You live in one direction. There's no reverse as we are living. You can't turn back the hands of time. There are brothers who know that. That you can't turn back the hands of time. When time, when life gives you a chance, you just take it and run. There are brothers who are like that. There are brothers who operate like the world is under their feet. Like they're in control of everything. <laughs> and then they think the nice sisters will always be there. And then the brother discovers when he's 40 something, like in love, that all the nice sisters have been taken. Not in a literal sense, but maybe the nice sisters in the age group that brother preferred, discovered that almost all of those nine sisters are now mothers. I want you to say mothers. <laughs> Once more say mothers. Ha! The brother keeps on saying, I'm pr praying for the perfect will of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we're not talking about such situations where people may make errors of judgment, where those situations are discounted, or where people will be engrossed on something and they miss certain opportunities in life. We're not talking about that. What we're talking about here, it's a situation where you are conscious of undergoing a certain trial. And you are consciously cooperating with God to produce the right character so that you attain the promises of God. Hallelujah. So trials prepare us for service. That's number four. Huh? It should be number four. Number five, I'm going to end at number five. Trials facilitate a process which is known as sanctification. They facilitate sanctification. They facilitate what? Sanctification. If you can listen to how a person who is undergoing trial confesses the same sins over and over again, you would understand what I mean about trials facilitating sanctification. If the person was a thief at grade one, one of these days when the person is approaching 40, he will be confessing that, Lord, I know I'm not worth it. Because at grade one, when I was five years old, I used to be a thief. It's only a person who is undergoing the process of sanctification, who is gaining in spiritual awareness of their inadequacies to stand before God. Trials, they enable us to what? To, to, to go through the process of sanctification. When we are experiencing trial, you must know that at the same time you are experiencing what? Sanctification. At the same time you are experiencing what? Sanctification. 
I want us to confess and say, when I'm going through trials, I know that I am undergoing sanctification. Once more, when I'm going through trial, I know that I'm undergoing sanctification. Hallelujah. Say, when I am going through trials, I know that I'm undergoing sanctification. For the last time, when I'm going through trials, I know that I'm undergoing sanctification. What is this sanctification that I'm talking about? It is the purifying of the inner person for the service of the Almighty God. It is the purifying of the what? Of the inner man. Hallelujah. You know, when we read in 1 Peter chapter 1, the Bible says, Blessed be the court and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you. So some of the trials that we are undergoing, they are for the final reward, which is reserved for us in heaven. Not a temporary reward. There is a reward which is permanent. So some of the trials that some people are going through, or most of us are going through, they are not even for this life. They are not even for this life. They are for the life to what? To come. We are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. There is salvation which we have already experienced and that we have received Jesus Christ. And then there is salvation which will be revealed in the last time. This salvation which will be revealed in the last time is facilitated by the power of God, which is keeping us through faith. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Now for a little while, if need be, if need be, what determines the need, the necessity? I test to be God. It can't be you and I. It can't be you and your pastor that you are able to manipulate. It can't be you and your pastor that you are able to buy sweets. And if it was up to your pastor, some of you, you wouldn't undergo any trials. Because you have got a lot of moolah. You just buy your pastor a nice car and you just finish this life without any trials. But glory be to God. Because trials are decided by God. If need be. I want us to say if need be. <laughs> In this you greatly rejoice. Until you arrive at a point where you rejoice. Like the apostles who rejoiced because they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Just imagine someone has been beaten for preaching Christ and they go out rejoicing. Trials, they must, you know, you must be tried to such an extent that you operate like a crazy person. When the devil is hurting you, they, he sees you rejoicing. If you, if, you, if you don't arrive at a stage of rejoicing when you are undergoing trial, it means you still need to be tried. I didn't say you want to be tried. I said you need to be tried. 
Because those who are matured by trials, in this they greatly rejoice. <laughs> in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Why are you grieved by various trials? Verse 7. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So do you realize that we are being prepared for the revelation of Jesus Christ? But according to this verse that I've just read, there is no one with the fake faith who will appear before Jesus Christ. Faith is fake, I know, but you won't even be able to stand before Christ with, with the fake faith. When, when you see yourself standing before Jesus Christ, at that time you must remember this same one and know that your faith is genuine. If you never see yourself before Jesus Christ when he arrives, you must also remember this same one that you failed to prove the genuineness of your faith. But I pray that your faith will be genuine and that you will be able to appear before Jesus Christ at his revelation. That the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes because gold will not, uh, will not facilitate your appearing before Jesus Christ. Gold is nothing before Christ. Imali, money, it's nothing before Christ. It's something before us if someone is a billionaire. But guess what? That will count for nothing when, when Jesus Christ is revealed. In 1 John chapter 3, the Bible says, when Jesus Christ is revealed, we shall be like him. It's only people with genuine faith who are going to be like Christ. Being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So one day Jesus Christ will appear, and then it will be clear why some people were undergoing trial. So one of the reasons why Christians undergo trials is to, is to enhance the genuineness of their faith, or to purify our faith. To purify our what? Our faith. So I'm going to conclude with Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, that we are children of God. And if children, then as, as of God and joined as with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Verse 17. And if children then as and as of God, and joint as with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him. So you are not a co-heir with Christ if you don't suffer with him. You have got to suffer with Christ. That we may be also we may be glorified, we may also be glorified together. So there's nothing like, I won't suffer, but I'll be glorified with Jesus Christ. There's nothing like that. If you want to be glorified with Jesus Christ, you must suffer with him. You must suffer with him. And the same apostle, the apostle Paul, in a scripture which I'm not going to read, 
which is 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17, which you are going to read on your own. He's saying our light afflictions, which are but for a moment compared to eternity, are working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So our suffering is waiting for us in the realms of the spirit. A far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So there is a strong possibility that some of us, you may suffer the kind of suffering which people won't make sense of. But when Christ is revealed, it will become clear why you were suffering. That work is called what? Sanctification. Otherwise, the suffering of people like Stephen, a man full of faith and power, who dies suffering, he was taunted to death. His suffering does not make sense. It appears like he's a wasted spiritual gift. But it's not a wasted spiritual gift. He was proving before God and men the genuineness of his faith. We'll continue these points. Uh, in our sermon on Sunday. Yes. So I'm done with the first five points. What trials do to us? We abide in the word of God. And the word of God abides in us. We produce good fruits. For the kingdom of God. The love of God the Father. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us now and forever in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Yeah, so we are not able to do the Zoom service today because we have to rush and commiserate with the, the people who are bereaved. Uh, one of our leaders lost a, a close relative and uncle. So we have to go and commiserate with them. So for that reason, uh, that's why Zoom was postponed. We will advise you when the Zoom group for, I mean, uh, when the meeting for the Asia, UK, and Australia group will be done, the second installment, you will be advised. Thank you so much. May God bless you.